Hello, welcome to another video and today we're looking at part two of our uh, video series where we discussed in part one um, causes of kyphosis and the, and the dreaded dowager's hump which is this. So, um, so now we want to look at what exercises you can use to, to basically go from this posture to this posture. Um, and unfortunately it's not one thing, there's a, many things. Um, but if you haven't seen part one, make sure you go back and watch that now because um, finding the, the original cause of the problem is crucial because the, any exercise that I might show you in this video are pointless if you don't address the, the underlying reason you developed it in the first place. Alright, so that's why I made that, that first video went for quite a while because there was quite a lot of factors, it wasn't just one. Um, so you need to go back and watch that now if you haven't seen that yet. Um, check the description on the video because there's articles as well that have a lot of detail that could, that can really help you to find that. So just understand finding the cause is probably halfway there. When, if you've if you've sort of done that, you've you've really just done the first part of your program, uh, probably the biggest part of the program. So some of the causes which I went through in detail in the previous video were inactivity, osteoporosis, especially lack of calcium, which sort of linked to that, lack of vitamin D, which is linked to that. Uh, depression and low self-esteem, um, sitting posture, walking posture, sleeping posture, uh, various occupations, sports and hobbies, um, so like musicians and stuff like that as well, hot cycling, um, sort of, uh, you know, the, these things, uh, the, all of these things here, by the way, are all something that's done over a long time. It's not just a one-off thing that suddenly you like that. It's, it's repetitiveness, it's on a low scale, there's no immediate danger but it builds up over time. Um, poor exercise selection in the gym is another thing. Uh, Sit-ups and stuff are a, are a good example of that. Poor exercise technique even, so you might have a good exercise but just doing it poorly. So all of these factors can contribute to creating that horrible posture. Um, so what's next? So, so let's assume you found the repetitive movements and you've begun changing them. Is it enough? No because there's, the reason it's not enough is there's going to be a hell of a lot of weakened areas from that posture you had for such a long time um, and they won't be strong enough to hold yourself in the correct posture they'll, they'll be tired very very quickly and you'll fall back into the, the bad position you had before because you just simply do not have the strength to hold it um, you may even not have mobility in, in areas that restrict you from getting in that position so so there's many things that may block you from trying to correct um, the position that, that you want to get into. All right. So, um, like I said a minute ago, there's no magic pill, and, for, and people are always searching for magic pills on you know on the internet. They're always YouTube's good, but um, a lot of people are just looking for an exercise to just just one thing or one stretch. And unfortunately, there's not. And you'll see in this video, there's quite a few. And I had to. Um, to make sure this video didn't go for two hours, what I've done is I've put a description under the in the in the video here of links to all the exercises I'm going to show you because if I was to actually show you the exercise, I wouldn't have enough. The video would go for too long. It's more about explaining um, what to look for and and then so for, for you to see how it works, I'll put it. I'll put the the minute mark that I'm showing you the exercise and then the link exactly to that exercise so you can go, go ahead and complete it. Alright, so um, first thing, you must assess your posture. So it, it's really useful to do this. There's many ways. There's manual tests that I do and there's also little iPad apps that I use. And I've done video on this before so check in the description below because there's an app, there's a video that I've where I'll show you how I use this. But basically by putting a grid on top of your static posture you can sort of identify areas of concern. You know, some of them are noticeable but some of them are maybe not. And you might and just by doing this you can sort of say, well, alright, I can see some differences in left and right and they're things I'm going to look for more closely when I when I'm um, doing the rest of my assessment because I, I'm now suspecting something in this region. Alright? And also it gives you a good um, measurement of improvement as you're going along. Are you making any progress? So you can actually got a baseline measurement of where you're starting and where you're heading to. So, uh, and this is a good example of where this was uh, done on the 12th of November of 2014. Then we did it again about a year later, um, and you can see noticeable difference in her in her improvement. And we measure in, in centimeters. You don't have to necessarily go to that degree, but 
just sort of having a baseline to start with is important. Um, really good quote on this is time spending in an assessment will, will save you time in your treatment. All right, so um, there's no one size fits all. Some people are going to need a lot of stretches, some people may need none. Um, the only way to know that is to test yourself and find that out. So I always start with the mobility side of things first and the reason for that is that tight muscles will inhibit weak ones, but which basically means that they, if you have an exercise to strengthen a weak one, um, but the tight muscles are overworking, they're just going to steal the work from the weak ones and do the exercise incorrectly. So you have a good exercise choice, but you just can't do it right because there's an imbalance between in, within the nervous system itself. So there's some muscles that are uh, what we call tonic muscles and there's some that are phasic. So the only way to sort of restore that is to really reduce the, the um, tonic muscles ability to do work by weakening them and you weaken them by stretching and massage. Alright, so um, now when, you, when I work on mobility, especially for kyphosis, it's really important to define the areas that, that you need to be stretched. So the worst thing you do is stretch everything. Um, you always, if you start stretching a muscle that's already weak and disabled, all you're going to do is just make it worse and, even, and, and make the opposing tight muscle even tighter. So you just create more stiffness from having a poor approach to stretching. So how do you test yourself? Well, the way I do it is I just basically run through a series of stretches from head to toe and anything that feels hard to do or lacks range of motion it's, it's something or it feels tight or it's, or it's a difference between left and right that's a real big thing then I know that I'll need to do the stretch if it doesn't feel hard to do or the range of motion is pretty good I'll, I'll, I may do a maintenance stretch after a workout but I won't do anything to try and improve it um, and I won't do it at the start of a workout alright so there's sometimes I'll stretch things at the start of a workout because I know that they um that they're blocking weak muscles, they're inhibiting them. So, so I basically just run through them from head to toe to find out what needs to be done. One of the first ones I'll start with is the levator scapulus muscle. So it's in one of the muscles around the neck. And you can sort of see here, here's a picture of where it is. And most people would, would know exactly where it is if they have neck pain because this is the one that's often very, very nasty and tight. And this is the one that actually gives people headaches. So, um, so this is a really important one to correct because with the kyphosis posture we often find the shoulders are sitting depressed and the scapula is very restricted so it basically sits too low in its resting position meaning it cannot elevate correctly when you lift your arm and this places massive strain on the neck muscle because it's left to do all the work by itself to raise the arm and obviously it can't do that it needs the assistance of serratus anterior lower trapezius even the upper trapezius it, it plays a role in that as you'll see in, the, in a minute but um, so this muscle is going to sort of work, start activating itself in a tonic uh, phase and it's going to start overworking and endlessly just creating a huge amount of dysfunction. All right, so, so to, to test that, and often you might find one side's worse than the other, so you'll spend more time on the, on the one you need to do. So again, check the description under the video here because there's a video that I have on our channel exactly how to do this stretch. All right, so check under there and I'll put the minute mark and the name of it and everything for you. Um, thoracic mobility, so I've spoken about this many times and obviously this is a huge factor with the kyphosis because this region of the spine is being compressed instead of it looking like a natural curve in it like that it's actually being pushed right out and it's being squashed and, it's, and now, now it becomes rigid so it begins to lose its ability for extension and rotation um, and as you just saw with the scapula it's a huge problem but it's also a huge problem for the lumbar spine because the lumbar spine is now going to be exposed um, is going to have to move more because the thoracic spine can't move all right so it's going to sacrifice stability because this one has no mobility all right so um, there's several ways that I test mobility on the thoracic this is this is just one of them this is the rotational one but there's also an extension one that I do um, so again check the description underneath and you can see how to do that um, and, again, and again you want to check left and right on these because often there's a difference between the, the two the pecs and the lats, um, these are the internal rotators of the shoulder so um, and they are often chronically short and tight and they're very much like levator scap, they just go into overworking mode um, and and you, you real, will need a stretching program for these, these guys are often tight and usually no pain in them um, but they're creating huge problems elsewhere so 
So there's the scratch stretch is probably the best one, which I haven't put a picture of that here, but that the scratch stretch, just so you know, is this one here. So it's like you're trying to scratch your back. All right, so that's a great sort of measurement of a test where you should be able to link your fingers together um, for optimal mobility and very unlikely for a kyphosis person to be able to do that. And two of the muscles in the way, big muscles in the way that are with that are the lats and the pecs because they, they're sort of rotating, pronating their hand in front of you instead of being able to externally rotate. So again, on its own, it's not enough, but all these things combined are starting to lead to you being able to correct things. Uh, trigger points. So trigger points are different to tight muscles. They're, they're, they're sort of like, um, usually like stabilizer guys. And you can sort of see these are two videos below. The, this is teres and infraspinatus and then the scapular thoracic region that we're trying to mobilize here. Um, sometimes stretching just can't get into these. These guys are just like little black holes and they're just sort of creating a huge amount of tension to try and create stability for the joints. But, but it's a false stability. Um, and the only way to sort of rid them is to release them with self-massage or, or a massage therapist. But most people can't see a massage therapist every day, but you could do self-massage with simple tools like these. All right, so this can be a handy thing. It's not, again, it's not all you need to do. It's just setting the scene for the things that will make the bigger effect. But remember I said before, you can't go straight to those ones if you don't release the tight things first. You must get rid of them for the weak ones to have a chance to do their job. Otherwise, the exercise will backfire on you. All right. Um, not ignoring the around the pelvis and the hips here. Right. They, they make no mistake. This could be a, a huge part of the problem. Could even be the underlying part of the problem. So um, stiffness in the hips and the glutes, are especially usually sort of sucking the hips under, and you're sort of flattening the back out. Um, the hips are just like the thoracic region that their main purpose is to provide mobility. When it loses this ability and becomes stiff and rigid just like the thoracic it causes huge problems to the joints above and below. So you need to sort of test all these areas so you know basic hip stretching even quads for ex it might be a problem hamstrings uh, could be maybe they're not but you want to sort of test them and see where there are. I've left out calves and, and, and that as well, but you could definitely check them and I would suggest to do so as well, but just to save time this video, I'm sort of looking from the pelvis up, but they could, they could definitely be an issue as well. But um, yeah, again, check under the description here because I'll put the links for these videos for you. Um, stability testing. So now we've gone from mobility, we go to stability. So now this is where um, it's not about just punching out planks and sit-ups. You really want to test like the reflex reactions. And this is a really good quote to sort of bear in mind of what stability training is all about. A lot of this is really sort of misunderstood. Um, so again, we sort of look at various areas first. So we'll look at neck stability. So very rarely do people pay attention to the weak muscles around the neck. And these are the muscles that are under the chin. And these are known as the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles. Um, you can feel them if you place your fingers on your throat and you swallow your saliva. So if you do that, you'll feel those muscles contract in your fingers. Um, these guys are prone to weakness. So these are the opposite to the levator scap. So the levator scap basically steals their work. But these guys, their work is to try and hold the head up, all right, so you can look in a, so you can see horizontally when you're walking and or just in life, or otherwise your head would fall down. So they, their job is to do that. But if they become weak and disabled, the levator scap has to do it, all right? Um, scalenes and all the other muscles around the neck there, all right? and they all start to develop stiffness to be able to hold your head up. So, so apart from just stretching them, it's really important to stretch uh, to strengthen the opposing side. So, if you make them stronger, there's not as much work to do here. All right. So, how do you do that? Well, there's a few ways I do that. They're usually quite strange exercises and quite simple. Um, this video here gives you two variations of one that's lying and one that's standing. This one here is sort of like mobilizing the, the stiff area under the neck there with it and breathing, sort of a bit of a unique, it's almost a mobility slash stability. Um, so there's a couple of good videos of ways that you can do that there. All right, so that's how you can begin working on neck stability. Lower abdominal and pelvis, so again, if we're releasing stiffness through the glutes, hamstrings, which are commonly the problem areas, then we know that there's probably a weakness around the, the abdominal um, and stabilizers of the pelvis. So 
Um, again, there's many ways I can do this. This is probably one of the best ways to test it and really sort of shows if there's a hip dysfunction where you basically your hips are trying to stabilize your pelvis instead of your abdominals. And like I said, this could be a big part of the problem of the continu continuation of your thoracic dysfunction. So a great way to test it. All right, so check under the description for that. Scapular stability. So now we've sort of moving into the shoulder region and lo really looking around how this works. This, this is, gets a little bit messy, right? This is really sort of gets a little bit complicated at times, but um, understand that if if this joint is compromised, you will still have to need, you'll, your body will still hold on to the stiffness to protect it. Um, so your mobility work that we've just discussed may not have any effect because there's still a problem with the stabilizing and the movement function of the scapula. So you have to really immediately follow up in all the mobility work with these sort of s simple strange looking drills that are just body weight but they, they're very effective if you, if you do them right and you, do, and you spend a bit of time to get them moving well and, and these on their own can start to really release a lot of stiffness because there's no need for the body to hold on to it anymore because it's starting to move in the way that it was and, and, and again you'll get rid of any shoulder problems and neck problems quite effectively from starting off with these drills. All right. Again, they won't be on enough on their own because you know, haven't developed any strength yet. You're just restoring the movement function. Um, I'll give you an idea of just how many different muscles are involved in the scapular function. This, the serratus anterior, this one's the crucial one actually, lifting up the rib cage plays a big role in that. But the lower trapezius is pulling down, the serratus is pushing up and upper traps as well, pushing up this way. So all three of these guys uh, assist in moving the scapula into what's up, called upward rotation. The lower trapezius and that are very much activating posterior tilt. So there's sort of two parts of the, the um, scapula function that are, are vital for releasing stiffness in this thoracic region. Because right? remember, that's where the dowager's hump is sort of sticking out the back there. All right, so don't disregard these drills that they can be highly effective at re releasing stiffness and getting you to move better. Um, when we start to get into like movement stuff, because so far a lot of this has been very static, very sort of isolated, now we're sort of going to get into more integrated. It's very useful to use a stick on your back and there's a video that I show you how I do this with sort of multiple movements, sort of there's some kneeling one here but there's some standing ones. Very, very effective for the person with kyphosis to really appreciate how much they their body moves while they're moving because they think that they're still in good, because they can s sort of um, position themselves perfectly when they're about to start, but once they move, they fall out of position, they don't realize it, they think they're in good position, but they're not. Um, the stick gives them instant feedback on where they are, especially their head falling forward, which is usually when their rib cage sort of depresses on itself, um, and they can really learn from the mistakes quite quickly. Um, so very highly recommended to, to use a stick when you're training. You're obviously gonna need a partner to be able to help you to do that, but um, that on its own can really change a lot of things. Um, so when we discuss movement, we, this is where we start to probably see things that are happening in the brain. So sometimes there may not be a mobility problem there at all, but the, it, it appears be, but, to be, but it's really just the way that you were doing that was the problem. It's the way that you were doing that was causing it. It was not like there was actually a problem at the joint. All right, so this is where you have all of the stuff you've discussed so far may not be an issue. It might be just when you move that it is. So, so when it comes to strengthening the serratus anterior and the lifting the rib cage, there's not really many better exercises to do this than the push-up. The push-up, in theory, is simple, but uh, however, it sort of presents a lot of postural problems, and a lot of people struggle to get this right. And that's where the stick comes in handy. Um, and again, we start to see good scapular function. There's a good video that I'll show you this, um, where Mel here has a wing scapula and how she uses a lot of drills to help herself correct that. Um, and this helps to wrap the rib cage around, uh, wrap the, the serratus around the rib cage, the scapula around the rib cage with ease. All right, so it's a very, very effective drill, uh, very, very effective exercise to developing your strength. Bending exercise, so the deadlift in the gym is what it's called, but in the real world, it's just called bending. Um, so this is, um, you know, we start to see a lot of problems with bending exercises, and, you know, and you, you can really sort of see in the videos, and I've done a lot of things on deadlifts before, but you can really start to get the appreciation of just how much it can change. Um, overhead strength, this is where we start to see that scapular depression. Um, you know, you sort of see these uh, depressed shoulders is very common to that 
um, kyphosis usually because they have so much stiffness and trigger points in their upper traps they avoid doing anything always just stretching 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 but it's actually become so weak that's why it has the trigger points where it should have some muscle tone as you, as you see here um, that actually helps to develop the strength and it that removes the trigger points it's a bit of a paradox all right so I've done many videos on this before and this is where a lot of people with that posture are actually sort of exacerbating their problem by only stretching and it's actually strengthening that they needed to do um, now how you do that is very can be a bit difficult because you can actually make things worse so there's a couple of good videos that you see how I go about that for simple versions and there's also some more complicated ones which I've put in the links below to sort of see them as well but developing strength in the upper traps will take quite a lot of time for this person right so you have to take your time with this um, another exercise that's quite useful is barbell squats you could actually say dumbbell um, sometimes barbell is impossible because the person with kyphosis can't actually get a barbell on their back uh, but front squats are probably a better choice but front squats are a much more complicated version of the squat so um, you know very tricky exercise in it for anyone really but especially with someone with postural problems so um, it's obviously squats are known for adding strength to the leg muscles but adding a barbell can actually really improve the strength of the spine so this is very important for a person with osteoporosis on the verge of you know or someone who spent a bit of time in strength training starting to get there and, you, and their skills are quite good this would be something that I would want to try and get to because I know that if I'm trying to really squash the spine because that's basically what it's going to try and do it means that you ha are having forced into finding a way to, to it for it not to be squashed and this is where the person who we saw, you know, with osteoporosis of, on tablets for calcium and eating protein and all this, but if they don't apply resistance training, there's no, there's going to be no structural change to the bones because there's just not enough resistance. This is where these exercises, they can be risky, but they can be highly effective. I always say to people, the very one thing that's going to hurt you is the same thing that you really need to do. If these people with osteoporosis were doing these exercises, there's a very good chance they wouldn't have had osteoporosis. They wouldn't have developed it. It's not bad luck that gave it to them. It's it's the poor diet with lack of resistance. All right, um, females need it more than males, um, and you just can't. The sooner you start, the better it is. So um, there's many ways to do the squat, and there's a couple of videos that I've put below. This one on the left here has a dumbbell version, and this one on the right has a barbell version. So. It differs a lot to the deadlift in that the deadlift, can, although it's a great exercise, can actually encourage scapular depression. And the squat's different because we're actually placing the, the load above and there's, there's actually no scapular depression. So um, so there's a huge amount of strength in both of them, but, but the squat in some ways is actually superior um, in that it sort of doesn't bring into play that, that issue of the scapula being sort of held or squashed down. All right, so I'd, I would prefer to start with a dumbbell with someone uh, before pro eventually progressing to the much more com complicated front squat. But I would have it in the back of my mind. That's what I want to do. All right, so there's a ton, there's a ton of other exercises that I do. Single leg things that would be great. You know, single arm pulls and pushes, wood chops, all those things are also good. But this just gives you a real good understanding of how I might go about through from a mobility to a stability side to then some general strengthening. Um, if I can do all the things in here well with a person, there's a very good chance that they're starting to reverse their kyphosis and their diogis hump permanently. Um, and they just need a lot of time because remember it was time that created it in the first place. All right. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to get in touch with me. And there's heaps of free reports. We have there's lots of programs that can help you if you've got back pain, shoulder pain, all those sort of things with lots of all the things laid out for you. So. Um, yeah, check out in the description below this ton of information that you, that can help you. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed that video and we'll see you on our next one.